All right, I think we're recording. All right, so um, so this lab is goes back to uh, chapter um, uh, chapter nineteen. It's uh, essentially it's a uh, the chapter on potential, but toward the end of that chapter was um, oops. Let's hit the wrong button. All right. So toward the end of that chapter was um, uh, a discussion on, on capacitors. And so the idea of capacitors, so see, you have to kind of go back to the to what we talk about in the uh, when we first talked about potential. All right. And so we first talked about this go to um, go to scenario. Uh, the parallel conducting plates. All right, so we have the parallel conducting plates. All right, and so I started off by saying that we have these parallel conducting plates and they have a charge, positive capital Q and negative capital Q on them. And I didn't really tell you how we got those charges. And then, of course, since they're conducting, so again, these are parallel conducting plates. Because they are conductors, the excess charge goes to the surface. That's one of the properties of conductors. The excess charge goes to the surface. So you have, you have excess positive charges on the surface of, let's say, the left plate. The right plate will have an equal uh, an equal number of uh, of negative charges, and of course these these charges behave this way because uh, you know be, because these are conductors. Conductors can only have charges on the surface. All right, and so we know that that um, we know some some properties of conductors. First of all, you know for conductors, and some of this is review, but again this is a we're we're officially on chapter uh, 24 and starting 25 and 26 this week, all right? And so we're really uh, this is taking us back. And in fact, by the time I I'm gonna I'm gonna give uh, I'm gonna produce produce a chapter 27 lecture uh, this weekend, which will finish optics. And when we finish optics, that'll that'll be all of the theory for any lab we have for the rest of the semester. After this, it'll be uh, modern physics, and we will not we will essentially not have. Uh, we're not going to have any modern physics labs, all right? So, so for a conductor, properties of a conductor, right? So all charges reside on the surface because they want to get as far away from each other as possible. And another property of a conductor is the electric field um, only has, or we'll say has only a normal component. Yeah. Only has a normal component uh, at the surface of a, at, at a conducting surface. It's a little bit of review. I mean, we've already tested over all this stuff. Okay, so what that means is that the only electric field components will be leaving the uh, positive plate perpendicularly or at, at uh, normal and entering the negative plate normal. So this is a way of creating a nice uniform electric field. Going from positive, every positive uh, charge Electric field line goes to terminates on a corresponding negative charge. Right through this row. And of course, you know, that's that's what it looks like. This is your electric field. All right, so we know that we can make a uniform electric field with parallel plate, uh, with, with the two parallel uh, conducting plates. And then and then um, so the question would be: well, how how did you get this? How do you get these uh, parallel plates charged in the first place? Well, you hook them up to a battery. So we create our first circuit element that we talked about, and that's called a capacitor. We hook up, we have a battery.
positive terminal and negative terminal. We always have a, and so we have, we take a wire, hook it up this way, and then it completes it in this way. So again, there's, some, there's a number of questions in the lab about uh, one particular question. If you go to, um, well, it's called conclusion. It's on page uh, five of the lab. One of the conclusions is describe and explain your observations using the law of conservation of charge and the properties of conductors, right? So the fact that you have uh, charges residing on the surface, these excess charges, when you, when you attach to the battery like this, that's a property of the conductor. Where do those charges go? Well, they go to, this, they go to these surfaces and, the, and, and essentially the excess charges will, well, you'll see a charge polarization will occur at the surface, at these, at these um, conducting surfaces. So that is a property of the conductors. And of course, the wires themselves are also conductors, right? Now, one of the things that we also talked about previously in chapter 19 was that there is a distance D across these parallel plates, all right? So again, these parallel plates will have, and this is a, really a three-dimensional picture. These parallel plates also have an area A. So the parallel plates, I mean, we're looking at it straight on. There, there's really a, three, a third dimension here. The parallel plates each have area A and separation D. Again, this comes into importance for our lab here. Okay, so um, the thing to keep in mind here is that we can also think about, and again, this goes back to chapter 19 again, is we can think about putting a test charge right at the surface of one of these, uh, let's say the surface of a positive plate. Now, of course, electric field always goes from higher potential to lower potential. That's another thing to keep in mind. Electric field always points <clears throat> from higher potential to lower potential. We haven't defined, well, we have, well, we, we've defined, we've, we've covered all this theoretically, right? So, so again, electric field is going, so, so the idea of a potential is you start off talking about potential energy first, all right? And so the idea is, well, we can, we can take, we can make an analogy with gravity. We can say, let's kind of make an analogy with gravity. Now, should gravity is that you have a zero potential right here, or we'll say zero potential energy. Screen still yet. And let's say we have a ball at some dis some height h. Now we understand that that ball has gravitational potential energy because gravity is a conservative force, has gravitational potential energy mgh. You know, again, this goes back to physics one. And we know if we release that ball, it'll gain kinetic energy at the expense of potential energy. All right, so this is, uh, this is how gravity works. Well, electric force is yet another, is another, is another conservative force. So if you're putting a, a positive test charge right at the, uh, at the positive plate, you let that go, what's it gonna do? Well, it's gonna accelerate. It's gonna accelerate with that force. It's going to gain kinetic energy at the loss of potential energy. All right, so essentially when you're putting this, you're putting this charge right next to the positive plate, it's, it's, it's as if you're going down an electrical hill. All right, so, um, so we have this concept that work is being performed. So work, so work W 
is going to always be F dot, let's say D, dot product of the force and the displacement. Well, we know that the force, because this is a, again, Q is a positive test charge. Test charge is always positive. So given that you have a positive test charge, it's going to accelerate in the direction of the electric field. All right, and so what is the force? If you, if you have an electric field, well, you find the force quite easily, and that is the force electric is just the test charge times electric field. I mean, that's what it always is. All right, so I can put that directly in here. And in fact, I can actually say that this is the electric force. So the work is going to be what? It's going to be, a, let me make one more statement. The electric field is also aligned with the displacement. All right. So again, the electric field is parallel with the displacement. So since they are aligned, it means the angle between them is zero. So then the work will just be uh, QE, and that's the force, dot D, or QED cosine of zero. And cosine of zero is, of course, one. So I can change this in and say that the work is going to be Q. E D. Okay, great. Work is QED. Which is also equal to the that's a network. That's also equal to the change in kinetic energy by the work energy theorem. And because the force is conservative. We get a second work energy theorem, and that is it's also equal to negative delta potential energy. Okay, so again, that's because electric force is conservative. All right, the three force is conservative. So again, in the review here. So now, we could say that the change in potential energy, the potential energy is lost, is also equal to the net work, negative QED. We can say that as well. And then we make the statement that, well, we have a problem here is that we are expressing a physics quantity or, or something in it that's uh, important or measurement, important measurement with respect to how we took the measurement. And I've made this analogy several times already, but it's, it's like me asking you what your temperature is and you telling me, oh, it's 98.6 degrees with the thermometer that I, I bought at Walmart or the thermometer I bought at Walgreens or, or, or CVS. That's, I don't care about what, you know, worry about your thermometer. The only point is I care that your temperature is 98.6 degrees, right? And so I don't really, I should never have to go and report how I took my measurement. So again, we have this, this, this test charge here, you're reporting how you took your measurement. So we don't wanna do that. So we'll divide out the charge and we create what's called the potential. We have the change what's called electrical potential. And I'm, all I'm doing is that's, that's really the change, of, the change in potential energy or the work, if you will, divided by the charge. And that's just gonna be negative ED. And so, we can effectively say, no, delta V, well, if I call this plate A and this plate B, well, delta V is what? Well, that, that would be V sub B minus V sub A is negative ED, or I can multiply both sides by negative and say that it's V sub A minus V sub B, which we typically call V sub AB, is ED. So we know 
this formula. Again, this is all review, but it's all important here for capacitors. So this is a formula that we also know for the parallel plates. All right, so we know that I always say, tell you V equals ED, but it's really the change. It's the, it's the, it's the potential across the, what we call the capacitor that's equal to ED. So we've created with these parallel plates, we create a, a, capa a capacitor. Now, the thing about capacitors is that, okay, so we, we have this relationship here, so we know that. So let's put this in a parking lot. So we call V sub A B the potential, again, this electric potential, ED, electric field times the separation. Again, V sub A B is again, the electric potential or the dip or, or the, we'll see, the electric potential difference. Or sometimes we just, we usually leave off the word electric. The electric potential difference across the plates, the uh, parallel conducting plates A and B. All right, so we know that. The problem is we also we also want to define what is called the capacitance. We want to when we put this hook this up to a battery, we essentially put this in a circuit, and we want to store charge. The idea of a capacitor is a capacitor stores charge. You see charge being stored on the conducting plates uh, when you have a capac. That's what we call a capacitor. So we know another relationship with capacitor is that the relationship is that this it stores charge. Again, it's all review chapter nineteen, but we have the charge that is stored on the capacitor is equal to something we call the capacitance times this potential difference, all right? So I can leave off this A, B. We just know it's a potential across these plates, right? And so we know that if we apply a potential through a battery across these parallel conducting plates, we store charge. That's what a capacitor does. Now we have this quantity called capacitance. Now what is the capacitance now? So again, we have to figure out a way of relating the charge to, to the electric field. And that's one of the things that's important here is, is, that, is that while we really, we really want to combine these two equations, we really want to make a statement um, that really is, well, what is the electric field? That's what I really need to know for, and I really want to be able to combine these equations and solve for the capacitance. I have the potentials, but the problem is, I, I, want, to, I want to be able to see if there is a way to actually uh, express an uh, electric field uh, for this charge distribution. I really need that. Otherwise, I have, a, I have, a, I have an additional uh, variable hanging around. So what do I do? Well, when I want to solve a, uh, a fundamental physics problem, I, I need to go to Maxwell's equations. Now, at the time we took chapter 19, which is what, what this, uh, lab is from, the only Maxwell equation we knew was Gauss's law of electricity. Now, you know, given that this week is the chapter 24 week, when you listen to chapter, again, this week is chapter 24 and beginning of chapters 25 and 26, which I'm covering as a unit. Um, chapter 24 is the graduation exercise, if you will, from electromagnetic theory proper. And so at that point, you, at this point in the, in the, in the theory, we now have all of Maxwell's equations. But let's, let's employ the one that we know back from chapter, uh, chapter 19. So we have Gauss's law. What does Gauss's law say? Well, Gauss's law says you take, you write, draw a Gaussian surface, all about your charges, all about the charge distribution. So again, all of these charges, I'm trying, if I did a good job, I'd be drawing a Gaussian surface right at the front part of this of this, uh, where the charges reside. The charges are gonna reside on the very far inside of this conductor. So I'm gonna draw a Gaussian surface about that. So Gaussian surface, and we're gonna apply Gauss's law. In theory, what does Gauss's law say? Well, Gauss's law says, again, Gauss's law of electricity, It says that if I take 
the dot product, by, if I divide up the surface, the, the, the surface area of this, the, the, divide up whatever, whatever the surface is. I mean, when I did Gauss's law in the lecture, I did it, I mean, the first time I did it, I did it over a conducting sphere. So I took the surface area of a sphere, divide up little patches, little area patches, and I performed Gauss's law. Now, what we really have here is we need to take the conducting surface, which is the flat part of this positively charged plate, divide it up into little tiny areas, little tiny area patches. And I'll, I'll notate, you know, the, I'll have a little index I. And the idea with Gauss's law is you divide up the little area patches, say E sub I, electric field, at area, uh, at patch I, dot product with the area A sub I. And that's equal to the charge enclosed divided by the permittivity of free space epsilon naught. All right. So again, these little A sub I's are, you know, they're little area patches. Covering the conducting surface. Right, so small that, uh, I don't know we're covering, so small that they really only have one electric field line going through them. They really should be differential. And so what I'm doing is here's the miracle of uh, Gauss's law is that for some reason, I mean, in the universe, it's one of the fundamental equations of all, all electromagnetic theory. For some reason, when I take the dot product of E sub I of the electric field when the area normal and every single one of these patches and of course dot products are what? They're scalars. I add them all up across a conducting, across a Gaussian surface. By a miracle of the universe, it's equal to the charge that's enclosed in that in that Gaussian surface divided by the permittivity of free space, which is the which is the um, uh, a special constant of the universe for electricity. Now we have a lot of really nice symmetry here, and again, Gauss's law is usually very complicated to to do, and usually you can only really uh, calculate Gauss use Gauss's law for situations of high symmetry. Well, we have a situation of high symmetry. It turns out very nicely that the electric field is all is always perpendicular everywhere to a conductor. And we know that because we have these parallel conducting electric fields. We, we set this up this way. So again, electric field everywhere. Electric field is everywhere. Normal to the conducting surface. All right, so this means that the um, electric field, so E sub I, E sub I dot A sub I everywhere, everywhere is gonna be just E sub I times A sub I times the cosine of zero because the normal and electric field vectors, every single patch, every area patch on the surface, the electric field and the area normal will be, will be parallel to each other. So I can, I can basically exchange this dot product for an ordinary product. So what I can say is, well, I can say I can take the hats off here and say, instead of this being E sub I dot A sub I, I can write this now as E sub I magnitude times A sub I. This is nothing more than an ordinary multiplication because they are always parallel. Now, the other thing is this is a this is a uniform electric field. All right, I set it up this way. This is one of the ways that you can actually create a uniform electric field. So E is, is uniform everywhere. So E is everywhere uniform. All right, so that means that I could just, instead of having E sub I, no matter what uh, area patch I'm talking about, E is always the same. 
All right, so I don't need this on. I have a constant E everywhere because the electric field is set up to be north, to be uniform between the, parallel, the connecting plates. So that's nice. And the other thing too is that if you have if you have a constant multiplying a summation, I can pull that constant out. I've said that a few times. So I mean, for instance, if I have if I have a uh, two plus four plus six, and I realize, wow, you know that. I see a summation there, but they're all multiples of two. I can pull the two out and say that's just the same as one plus two plus three. It's the same thing. I, I could take that constant and pull it out. So that means that I can actually take this E out of the summation. All right. And so I can do that, pull the E out of the summation. And I'm doing a lot of al erasing algebra here. So, but that's why you have video. So pull the E out. Now what do I have? Well, now I have a problem of, I want to add up all the little areas of an area patch, all the area patches, the areas of all the area patches of a flat plate that has an area capital A. Well, if I divide the flat plate of, care, of area capital A into little patches, I add them all up, well, what am I going to get? A, right? So again, this complicated calculation for this very simple high symmetry, high symmetry situation, left side becomes nothing more than EA. All right, and of course, the charge that's enclosed is Q. All right, and so what I get in this particular situation, I, I have a, one of the few times I know the electric field exactly uh, through a, a derivation, so I can just literally divide and say, well, I know for an electric, for a, parallel, for a charge plate, the electric field from a charge plate is always going to be Q over epsilon naught A. I always know that. That's the electric field. From a from a charged plate, all right. Electric field from a charged plate. And I derive that from Gauss's law. And Gauss's law, the Gauss's law, the is supposed to answer, given the charge distribution, what is the electric field of some place in space, some point in space. That's what Gauss's law is supposed to answer. Well, it answers that here. My charge distribution just has to be uniformly uh, uh, over the surface of a flat plate, flat conducting plate. So again, this electric field. from a charge plate or a conducting plate of area A. Great, so I'm almost where I wanna be. So what I now know is, let's see here, I can take this electric field and I can now substitute it up here. I know the V equals ED, I already drive that. So I can substitute electric field from up there. Let's do it. So instead of E, I will write Q over epsilon naught A. And then I'll write, uh, I'll write D that I had before. So again, I said Q equals ED, but I know E. I know it explicitly in terms of charge. So now it's Q over epsilon naught A times D. Now what I just have to do is, is compare these two formulas. Let's see here, I have, I, I always know for a capacitor, Q must, Q must equal CV. That is a definition of a capacitor. I need to find a capacitance. And for a parallel plate arrangement, what do I have? Well, what I can, what I can then say is, well, let's see here. I wanna, I wanna figure out, let's, let's just say I, I have a V, I can basically substitute here. And I want to try to figure out the relation, I wanna try to figure out what C is. So I can say, well, Q is C times Q over epsilon naught A times D. These Qs cancel out. And I get that the capacitance for a parallel plate capacitor is epsilon naught A over D. That is the capacitance. Now that's the capacitance of and not, not, all, not just any capacitor, but a parallel plate capacitor. Now, most capacitors that you pull off the shelf are gonna be cylindrical. All right, now the, the cool thing about this is you look at it and say, well, I have this capacitance. Notice that nowhere in there does it say, I have, is it made out of aluminum or is it made out of, out of uh, gold or, or, or whatever. 
or copper. It's only depends on geometry. If I want to increase the capacitance, I either increase the area of the place, I increase the numerator, or I reduce the denominator. I mean, that's the name of the game here. So I, I have a capacitor. Now, if I were to do this, let's say for a cylindrical capacitor, I would also notice I'd have to do some integral calculus. I'd have a natural logarithm and stuff in there, but I would notice that it only depends on geometry. If I were to take a spherical capacitor, again, cylindrical capacitor, cylindrical capacitor would be like, uh, you know, a conducting cylinder inside of another conducting cylinder. Spherical capacitor be a conducting sphere inside of a conducting sphere. What we have is two parallel plates that are together, right? But again, two pieces of metal, any two pieces of metal, I don't care how ugly they look. If I separate them, I have two pieces of conducting metal, I could make a capacitor. I probably could not, I, in no way would I be able to figure out analytically what the capacitance of this arrangement would be. It's too complicated. I need I need a situation of high symmetry to do that, all right? Now, the name, the name of the game of this lab is to look at this equation. We, are, we have a, uh, a parallel conducting plate arrangement. Now, I'm gonna erase this and let's kind of just take a look at, we have this parallel conducting plate arrangement. Well, maybe I shouldn't erase that, but no, let's see. Um, so the important equation coming out of this is C equals epsilon naught A over D. Now, what I want to do, remember, is for a given voltage, I like to put as much charge storage as I can. All right, so the name of the game is for a given voltage. We would like to store as much charge as possible. How do I do that? Well, and I said for a given voltage. That means I'm going to kind of say for a given voltage, you know, some value of volts. How do I match my charge? Well, I want to increase the capacitance. Well, in the electronics industry, we're all about miniaturizing things, right? So we don't want to go and say, well, let's make the area bigger of the plate, right? What we like to do is keep the plate as small as possible, but minimize this D. Try to make D, D as big as possible, as small as possible, right? Two ways to make a big fraction. Either you, you, you increase the numerator or you, or you decrease the denominator. So the name of the game would be, well, let's, let's make the denominator as small as we can, all right? So, you know, we want to miniaturize, we, we want to miniaturize electronics. So let's try to make D as small as possible. Well, if you do that, bad luck, right? Because you also, you still have this equation happening. B equals E D. What does that mean? Well, E electric field is B over D. So if you are trying to make D as small as possible, guess what? Now you have a large growing electric field. At some point, you're gonna reach the, the uh, breakdown, uh, the breakdown uh, field and you will spark. So the problem is um, making D small um, gives a large electric field leading to electrical breakdown. That's why we have lightning. If it gets too big, you know, you, you get a zap. So leading to electrical breakdown. Which is a fancy word for a spark. Or a spark. So we don't want, I mean, you don't want sparking electronics. So that's not good either. So what do you do? 
You want to try to you want you want to try to get as much charge as you can for a given voltage. You want to try to minimize this distance, but the problem is you run into this run into this problem. So what do you do? You use what's called a dielectric. Yes, it's part of the part of this lab. You want to use a dielectric. <laughs> you want to try to beat this. So you employ a dielectric. Dielectrics have, I mean, it's a win, 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 win situation for a dielectric. Okay, so you go back to this situation where you had the parallel plates. All right. Parallel. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to sandwich a material in there and stuff it full of a dielectric. Now, this is a dielectric material. Now, dielectric materials are polar. So, dielectric materials consist of polar molecules. which are molecules that have a positive end and a negative end. A good example, a great example is water. You notice that when you when you have a test tube with water in it, you know, if I have a test tube with water, water never never is just straight. You know, you don't just have a straight level uh, on water. Water always you have a little smile. You have what's called a meniscus. Water actually gets attracted to the sides of the glass, and and this is this is very much exaggerated, but you have what's called a meniscus here, and and because <coughs> water is polar. It gets attracted to the glass. All right, so the, the water molecules are very much polar, and, and that's just the way they're shaped. I mean, water molecules, you know, H two O. You have if you have the oxygen, you have a couple hydrogens. Well, again, the way this is set up, you know, this is um, it's a hundred eight degree angle. We know that we know the water molecule very well. So what ends up having, you have a, a slight negative charge on one side and a slight positive charge on the other. Water is highly polar. In fact, it could be, it may very well be the one of the best dielectrics you can have. What happens is all these molecules, when you're applying this electric field, a number of things are occurring. First of all, <coughs> the negative ends of the polar molecules are all going to kind of line up with your electric field. They're gonna line up and they're gonna give you more charge on the surface. You'll, you'll, you'll have the negative ends lining up and they're all gonna kind of pretty much line up like that. And then on the other side, the positive ends will line up. All right, so first of all, you get more charge just from these extra these extra charges from the from the pol from the polar uh, the polar molecules in the dielectric. So first of all, you get more charge, you get more charge on the on the uh, on the place which which is what you wanted. Number one, <coughs> what are the advantages? So for a dielectric, so the advantages of, a, of using a dielectric. I mean, it's a win, win, win every way. So first of all, more charge on conducting plates. Now, electric field strength. Electric field strength, right, is, is, how, is the density of electric field lines. How many electric field lines per area? 
Well, because of this dielectric, only a few electric field lines are actually gonna make it all the way across. You only get a few. And the rest of them are gonna be blocked. So, you, so the left, number of electric field lines reduces. The ones that actually, most of them are gonna get stopped at the dielectric. Only a few will go across. So that means you're gonna have a weaker electric field strength. All right, so much fewer electric field lines And you're worried about electric field strength anyway because of electrical breakdown. <laughs> so very, much fewer electric field lines cross from plate to plate. And there's one other thing, right? When we had breakdown before, we had the electrical breakdown of air. And air is one of the weakest uh, me media for electrical breakdown. Most dielectric materials are going to beat air by a mile. So not only are you going to get fewer electric field lines going from, going from plate to plate, you're going to have even a better electrical breakdown. So you got, you got a positive right there as well. So again, the electrical breakdown, or the, the uh, what we call it the, the electric field for breakdown, For a dielectric, is better than air anyway. Another pause, and then finally, how do you hold these this capacitor together? What's the stuff that would hold together? You know, if you have a cylindrical cylinder and another cylinder, what's going to hold together? Well, it actually gives you structure too. So, if nothing else, a dielectric even gives you structure, physical structure. It has nothing to do with electricity. Just how do you hold this thing together? Right, and so what you uh, basically you define what's called a dielectric constant. Okay, and the dielectric constant is actually going to be unibus. And you take this formula and you just multiply it by kappa. Kappa is the dielectric constant for a given material. You look this up in a table. And so your your uh, capacitor formula is going to be what it was before enhanced by some number kappa. Now kappa officially is the, um, <clears throat> is the uh, so kappa officially is the ratio of the electric field in a vacuum to the electric field in the material. All right, so it's a ratio of electric field. Right. And so um, essentially it's E naught electric field in a vacuum. Remember, your, your electric field is reducing in the, in the dielectric material because you have fewer field lines. So it should be smaller. E is electric field in medium, dielectric medium. All right. So that's what kappa is. Kappa is unitless. Has no units. You look it up. It's something you have to go look up. So we'll see that in the software. Okay. So that is really the long and short of it. So you have to so get um, a, a huge amount of advantage by by using a dielectric. All right. So you get to make nice miniaturized electronics, store charge as you need to for your, your radio, whatever it is you're going to use. And again, so this is really the operating equation we're going to use in this lab. That's it. C, the capacitance is kappa, epsilon naught, A over D. All right, now, that's the theory part of, of this and a um, little bit more than what Dr. Edmonds gave, but again, the lab itself is uh, pretty straightforward. And so I'm not probably really gonna go to the, well, let me go to the whiteboard a couple more times, but all right, so let me fire up. I mean, I already have everything up, so let me, uh, uh,
me share my screen. I have the software. Okay. Um, so here's the software um, when you fire it up. <clears throat> and you notice that there is a, a wire. It's really a very simple, uh, uh, well, first of all, you fire up the software, you have to select the dielectric, uh, the dielectric tab. And then you really just have a, a, a dielectric, a, a couple of parallel plates and a battery. You have the ability to use arrows to either make this go uh, smaller, if I can do so. Uh, not working here. Okay, hang on. Mm. Hang on one second. Stop sharing. Oh, I know what I'm doing. Right, hang on. Let me uh, change the way I'm viewing things. All right. Sorry about that. Let me try that again. Share screen with you again. All right. You guys still with me? Yes. Oh yes, we're here. Awesome, all right. So here we are. So I have the ability to make this thinner or bigger. Um, I think I do. My computer is starting to act weird here, so I hope. There we go. <laughs> wow. All right, so I can make it thinner. All right, all right. I can change the uh, separation distance. I can also uh, change the plate area. So I can make the plate area, let's say, bigger. All right. I'm having a little difficult time with the software here. If it should crash, we'll all come <laughs> back on. We'll do it right. again. Now, hopefully it doesn't, but all right, there you go. So you saw that I updated it. So what we wanna do is we wanna start off by looking at uh, just varying the, the area and keeping the distance constant, the, dis, uh, the separation distance constant. So I'm trying to, trying to bring the area, I'm trying to bring everything back the way it was. I'm getting a very delayed response. So, okay, here we go, 100 and, okay, so I need to go and bring this, the, the separation this usually starts off at about 10 millimeters. There we go, all right, that's the initial situation. The minute, the area in this, of, this, of these plates ranges from 100 millimeters squared to 400 millimeters squared. The separation ranges from 10, millimeters down to, I believe, one millimeter. All right, so now this little box in the side is, is the dielectric. Right now, the dielectric is not in the, um, it's, not, it's not in the capacitor. So the way this thing reads is, number one, we're gonna, we're gonna select the dielectric that we want. We can go off to the side, and here the, you, know, you have the ability to customize it if you so desire, or you can select one. So we have, we have paper, paper has a, a constant <clears throat> a 3.5. So we'll select the paper at 3.5. So now the, the dielectric is now paper. Kappa is 3.5. I mean that's the that's the value that we use for the scientifically accepted uh, for this for this lab. Now record the values of the plates area A naught initially um, should be the largest you should, have, you should start off with the smallest possible areas. So that's where it is right now. Smallest area is 100 millimeters squared. And we want to actually start off with the largest possible uh, distance D, right? That's the way it's set up right now. D is, largest D is 10, 10 millimeters. <coughs> now, keep in mind that the area is in millimeters squared. Okay, we want to put an S size. So we're going to want to put that into meters squared. So you're going to want to fill out this table, table that's in the middle of page two. And so we can take a look at the table right now and see, we want to start off by, um, Uh, one second here. 
Okay. We, yeah, we want to put, okay, so number one says put the dielectric completely into the uh, capacitor. Right now you see there's an offset value. We want that offset to be zero. So we're going to stick it all the way into the capacitor. Right now, you know, it's a zero millimeter offset. Dielectric is entirely sandwiched in the capacitor. Now we want to take a look at the capacitor meter. So we click the little box here and that gives us the meter. So we'll see that that tells us what the capacitance is. So we know what the capacitance is. Now, <clears throat> be very careful. Uh, the software sometimes has uh, issues with the, um, with its um, presentation. Uh, you'll notice, be really careful. I, I mean, again, I, with my eyes, I, I see that as 0 0.31 times 10 to the 12th farads. Well, there's no way that that's true. But if you look, if you look at the scale, it's 10 to the negative 12. So that really should read 0 0.31 times 10 to negative 12, negative 12. So 0 0.31 picofarads, right? It's 0 0.31 trillionth of a farad. Remember, one farad is a very large capacitance. Sorry. So in my in my table where you see uh, zero, the row row zero in that table, I'd write the area. Now I wouldn't write 100 millimeters squared. You want to convert that. There's a thousand millimeters in a meter, so you actually want to divide by a thousand squared. So the trick is you want to divide by a million. So whatever that number is on the area, you divide it by a million, one times 10 to the six. That gives you the area in meters squared. So what I would, what I would write in the, in the upper left uh, box or the box, the area box for row zero, for row zero is 1.0 times 10 negative four. And 1.0 to 10 negative four would be the area for row zero. The corresponding capacitance, Again, I would write in the area, I'd write right next to the A in area, I'd write parentheses meters squared to remind myself that, yeah, this is in meters squared. So one, again, for row zero, the area, uh, which should, should be, I'd have it as 1.0 to 10 negative four. Uh, the capacitance, um, 0.31 to 10 negative 12. Again, so again, that's negative 12, not positive 12. Dude. There's no capacitor in the universe that would be positive 12, so. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so what you want to do is vary the area in little increments. And so, and again, the maximum area is 400 millimeters squared. So I might, I took an area, I took my next area, it's about around 206.7, I think is what I got. So if I grab this and move it a little bit, uh, 116 is probably not far enough. Yeah. I, I did one around 200-ish. So I'm just pulling out the area and I'm just gonna get essentially four readings. I don't know why this is not working for me. Here we go. This might be one, you know, maybe 160, 164 or whatever. <clears throat> so in that particular case, I might write, you know, for, um, I might write in row one, for instance, I might write instead of 164 millimeters squared, I, of course, would divide that by a million, and I would write 1.64 times 10 negative four, right, for the area, you know, and then for the capacitance, I'm, I, I would look at that and go, well, let's see, what would, what is the capacitance? I look at the capacitor meter, that'd be 0 0.57 times 10 negative 12. I mean, I'm just reading the bottom of the capacitor meter. Yes, I know it looks like 10 to the 12, but it's really 10 to the negative 12, trust me. So it would be 0. 0.6, or is that, I'm sorry, that's 0. 0.57, I apologize. 0. 0.57 to 10 negative 12. And I would do this for basically three more readings. I took the, fi I took the final reading to be the maxed out area. So I took, my fi I took the final reading all the way out to 400. And so again, I took one at like 206.7. <clears throat> I took one about 266. I took another one about... 352, and I took my final one right here at the max out value. So that would be what? Well, 400 millimeters, what is that really in meters squared? You divide that by a million. So it's 4.00, I'm saying negative four. What's the capacitance? Well, I read the bottom of this capacitor meter, and it's 1.26, I'm sorry, 1.24 times 10 negative 12. So again, I'm just gonna get five area capacitor readings. And then what do we do? Well, we're going to go to Excel, all right? 
And so I'm gonna stop showing, I'm gonna stop sharing this. I'll share my Excel. You guys still hear me okay? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm doing all kinds of dangerous things here. So at any point <laughs> we could crash. I'm doing living Live dangerously. dangerously. Living dangerously, <laughs> indeed. All right, so I'm going to share Excel. And again, I'm not gonna go through all the Excel basics. I mean, we did that before. It's a lot of the stuff in Excel, we're just doing the same thing over and over again. So you go to the, the data. And I put all my data in one spot like I normally do. So this is the area versus capacitance. And these are my four data points or my five data points, right? And all I'm gonna do is just, you know, as usual, highlight the two columns. Again, the, <clears throat> the uh, independent variable is always the left column, the dependent variable is the right column. Maybe that, that takes a little getting used to for some people. And then you just go to, again, insert, and you know you go to your chart which should be a um which should be your scatter plot right just with, just with, with uh, dots i did that already <clears throat> i stuck it over here <clears throat> you want as dr edmund says here on on number four you want to label your axes again i'm having a little delay here here we go so i label my axes now this came out really small for some reason let me let me make this bigger that's weird. I know I made this bigger this morning. All right, so I did a trend line, a linear trend line. And um, again, I, I labeled the uh, the uh, plot appropriately, capacitor, a parallel plate capacitor with a paper dielectric versus plate area, okay? Uh, the <coughs> the uh, vertical uh, axis is capacitance and, far and farads. The, the horizontal axis is plate area in meters squared. And what this tells you is that this gives you a formula. So I wrote this formula right down uh, at the uh, just below sub step three in, in step four. So right where, right where it says record the equation of the best fit line, I stuck it in there. Right? Again, I got, I have three times 10 negative nine X plus five times 10 negative 16. What, what, what that really is, is C is three times 10 to the negative nine A plus five times 10 to the uh, negative 16. So actually, let, let me uh, write. I didn't correct my, uh, I need to correct my formula real quick. All right, so that is a best fit line. And we'll get back to this best fit line in a moment. All okay? right, so right now it's, it's three times 10 negative nine. So C is three times 10 negative nine A, because your X is A, right? Plus five times 10 negative 16. All right, so that's what we have here for this equation. We'll get back to this in a moment, All right? Now, let's go back to the, um, to the software. And uh, first of all, let me uh, let me stop sharing my Excel. All right, so that's all we that's all we really do there. Let's go back to the software now. Oops, right here. Okay, <clears throat> we want to set everything back to the way it was before. Take the area back to minimize it. The distance separation has not changed. No, I'm having a big time delay. All right, sometimes the software doesn't want to do what I want. Zoom Can you just hit the reset all? Yeah, I guess I could, yeah, I could do that. Oh, I got it. <laughs> this takes a while for the software to listen to me. I get Zoom really is must be a hog. It just is really eats up stuff. So. Anyway, the next <clears throat> set of stuff to do, I mean, all this, that's all number five tells us to do in, on the bottom of page two is just reset everything. So again, you're reset at the minimum area and the maximum separation like you were before. 
Now all you're going to do is just is uh, there's a plot, there's a table on the top of page three, and there you're going to you're going to take uh, five different separation settings. Now again, you want to do everything in meters, and so here you have everything in millimeters. So again, you know the separation, you know the left column is separation. You want it in millimeters. So of course, what are you going to do? You're going to divide by a thousand. So it wants you to use that initial arrangement as your first data point, your row zero. So your uh, your D column there will be 0 0.01. And of course I would, I labeled the D, I stuck a parentheses M next to it for meters. Your one over D, I put a parentheses M to the negative first. Of course that's one over D, that's so one over 0 0.01 is 100. So again, that for the, for the, so the first row should read, you know, the, the D should be 0 0.01, can, has to be in meters. Your one over D should be 100. And then what's the capacitance? Well, I just read it right off the meter again. Again, it's 0 0.31 times 10 to the negative 12. Again, that's negative 12, not positive 12. And, you know, it's picofarad. Capacitance values they usually come in contact with are usually very small. Microfarad, nanofarads, picofarads. Certainly nothing like 10 to the 12. I mean, so anyway, now you're going to do what now? You're going to take about uh, now again the separation goes all the way from 10 millimeters down to one so i just picked intermediate values of the separation and figure out what the what the uh what the uh, capacitance was and so again i'm leaving the plate area alone it's minimized and i'm picking another value to place separation so maybe maybe uh 8.5 like i've written now so what would i write down well I would put 8.5 times 10 to the negative three in the first column. Um, I would, so 8.5, 10 to the negative three. Well, again, that would be row. I mean, that, this would, I mean, if I was doing this row one, I had a different number when I did it, but row one, um, um, the D column. And of course, the one over D, you flip that upside down. One divided by 8.5, 10 to negative three, that's, that's 117.65. And then of course, I'd write down what the capacitance is. Point, you know, in that case, 0 0.37 times 10 to the negative 12. And I would do it for a couple more intermediate values. And I think the last value, the bottom of it should be your minimum. So I think it goes down as low as, I guess it goes as low as five. All right, yeah, so five is the smallest one. Okay, so it goes from 10 to five. So I would pick, you know, something like I just did and maybe two more intermediates. In the very bottom, row number four, I think what he wants you to do is pick the uh, five times ten, no, five millimeters. So again, my my row four would be my D would be five point zero ten negative three in meters. One over D, well one over five times ten negative three, that'd be two hundred. And of course, the corresponding capacitance would be zero point six two times ten negative twelve. So again. I would go back into Excel, and what he wants you to do now is you want he wants you to plot C versus one over D. So you have the one over D column that you have. He wants you to plot C versus one over D. And again, that should also be linear. So when you have when you complete that table, I'll stop showing. Go back to Excel. Oops, let me uh, share this <clears throat> all right back to excel here we go all right so that would be my next tab and again i i i again did i i showed, I showed you two sets of data so again that <clears throat> set of data and there's a little delay here set of data on the right side now was my one over d versus c all right, and so I plotted that in the same way. And I don't know what happened. Here. <laughs> I swear this was blown up, but okay. Um, let me make this so I can even read it. Did a trend line. All right, so this time around the uh, your equation, I wrote the equation right, 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 right above the word conclusions. Um, you know, I got C equals three times 10 to the uh, 
negative 15. Again, so you see X there, that's really, that's really your one over D plus one times 10 negative 15. All right, so, so again, you know, I got, you know, uh, you know, you see Y equals three times 10 negative 15, X plus one over times 10 negative 15. Well, what that really means is that's C equals three times 10 negative 15 times one over D, that's your variable one over D, plus one times 10 negative 15, all right? So that really is all of the work, well, not, actually not quite yet. Um, that's uh, really the work for this first part of the lab. So conclusions, to your conclusion. So, so first of all, um, it says summarize based on your graphs, how the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor depends on area of the plates and the separation between the plates. So let's kind of, let me go back to the whiteboard a little bit and, and discuss what did we just do? All right, back to the whiteboard. Well, I already have the equation written up that that's important to us. C equals epsilon naught A over D. What we just did is said, well, in the first plot, we, we uh, vary C versus A. And so first experiment, we did C versus A. Well, what really what we have here is C is kappa epsilon naught over D by A. So your slope, the slope of your line is this, is this set of numbers, kappa epsilon naught over D. That's your slope. When you saw, you saw your slope, you got that, the y equals mx plus b kind of equation. Well, that is your slope right here. You can derive kappa from that slope. You're, you know d. D is a, I mean, d is a, is a given setting. Remember, for in the area, d was a constant. D was always 10 millimeters. We just varied the area. We kept d at a constant. We know d is a, it's a constant. Epsilon is a constant in the universe. We can use this to determine kappa. Or the second experiment, what did we do? Well, we varied C versus one over D. What's that look like? Well, then again, that's gonna be C is kappa epsilon naught A multiplied by one over D. Okay, so that's our variable now. Our variable, again, a y equals mx plus B, our variable now is one over D. The slope now is kappa epsilon naught A. So what Dr. Edmonds wants you to do essentially is figure out kappa from at least one of those two measurements. I picked this one. I picked the, uh, the first, the first uh, set of quantities to get my kappa. Um, so the, um, let's see, is that what I did? Yes. All right. So let me go back to, let's see here. All right. So that's the conclusion. So I, I said, <clears throat> Based upon the two plots produced from the above, you know, the, the above experiment, we see that the capacitance is directly proportional to the plate area. Okay, you saw that from, you know, the plate area A, you saw that certainly the capacitance is directly proportional to the plate area. We got a nice uh, straight line from that. And inversely proportional to the plate separation D, which is another way of saying it's directly proportional to one over D, right? So again, I said, based upon the two plots produced, from the above, we see that the capacitance is directly proportional to the plate area A and inversely proportional to the plate separation D. These, these findings agree with uh, the theoretical formula uh, for, the for the capacity for a parallel plate capacitor, C equals epsilon A over D. So again, the, the, the theoretical formula is, is C equals kappa epsilon naught A over D. And we definitely saw that <clears throat> the formula would predict that the capacitance is directly proportional to the area. The formula would also predict that it's directly proportional to one over D, or another way of stating it is inversely proportional to D. All right. So, says so. The software absolutely verified this um, this uh, formula. 
Now, <clears throat> on the bottom of page three, you want to use the slope of one of your graphs to calculate kappa, the dielectric constant of, of paper. Show the calculation below, compare it with the value given by, this, by the simulator and find the percent error. All right, and so again, I'm picking one of my plots. I'm getting the you got to do this yourself, get your own numbers, right? But uh, for my plot, you know, I said, okay, well, <clears throat> I had, I'm going to pick the first experiment. I mean, you can pick the second experiment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick, you know, the first plot. And I, I could pick either 50-50. What did that plot tell me? Well, I had, what was my equation? Well, I had C. <clears throat> was um, uh, three times 10 negative nine A. Again, the numbers aren't very good in this uh, in this software. They don't really give you much precision. That was a little bit unfortunate, I guess, but plus five times 10 negative 16. That was what I read off of my, off of my plot. But what I really care about is this, right? This is my slope, I'll call it S. That's my slope. What's the slope tell you? Well, again, I'm varying by A. So the slope is really the same as kappa epsilon naught over D. So I can, I, I know the slope, I know epsilon naught, and I know D, so I can solve for kappa. Kappa is SD over epsilon naught. In my case, uh, I got a slope. I mean, I, I can read it right here off the, off the uh, trend line equation. I got three times 10 to the negative nine. I guess, what would that be? It's Farad's per meter squared, I guess. <laughs> One of many units you can express this as. Uh, times the distance, well, it was a constant 0 0.01 meters. And epsilon naught is a constant in the universe is always 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 Coulomb squared per meter squared. And somehow if you're using SI, this goes to unity, unitless, num uh, unitless numbers. So I got, when, I, when we were, went through all this stuff, I got cap is 3.39. That's what I got. You know, you'll get a different number, you'll have different numbers than me. So how does this compare? Well, it wants a percent error, right? So percent error, will be kappa experimental minus kappa theoretical, absolute value of that, divided by kappa theoretical, which I'm taking as truth, times 100%, right? Percent error. I did 3.39. I do a I did an absolute value, so I don't, I mean, I, you know, my answer is always positive. Uh, minus 3.5, that's what it tells you. That's, a, that's what the, it tells you uh, on the software. The, that's the uh, dielectric constant for paper. Divided by 3.5, <clears throat> multiplied by 100%. So for me, my percent error ended up being, I got, I got about 3.1%. You'll get a little different number, probably. I mean, that's not bad given the how rough these numbers are. These are very rough numbers. But again, I found kappa by solving the slope from the from the trend line equation, and I just compared it with what's considered the scientifically accepted value for the dielectric constant for paper. Okay. Uh, We'll go back to the software now. There's not much more to do on this. It's a fairly short lab. Um, going back to the software. Um, now it wants you to look at the effect of the dielectric. Okay, and this could be a little confusing, I would think. So let me, uh, uh, let me share the software yet again. All right. We're back to the software. So revert the values of the plates area and plate separation to the original and remove the dielectric entirely from the, from the capacitor. Okay, so we want to take the dielectric out. And there's a, oops, 
there's a little um, delay in everything that I am doing here. So bear with me. All right, dielectric is out. Let's get the uh, separation to its max value. The plate separation is at its minimum. That's all, that's the original configuration of this. All right, let's wait for this thing to respond to me. All right, here we are. So back to the original. So what are we doing here? So um, now, show the capacitance, charge, voltage, and energy meters, all right? We already have the capacitor meter up, so you're just gonna select these other boxes. So we want the, we want the charge on the plate. Yeah, that meter comes up. We want the stored energy. We also want a voltmeter. All right, and so what we're gonna do is we already have a battery connected. So you wanna take the, um, the red positive um, prong here, I guess, I don't know what you call these, connective to the plate, and then the negative to the negative to the other plate. So we should get a zero reading. Yeah, all right, so given I have a zero, not a question mark in my voltmeter reading, that means I, I did it right. So I'm touching metal to metal. Okay, now you notice that everything is zero at this point, right? Because the battery is set at zero volts. You notice there's a slider bar in the battery. It's currently set at zero volts. There still is a capacitance there, right? Because capacitance only depends on geometry. Doesn't depend on, it's the same capacitance whether there's a battery hooked up or not. I take two metal plates, uh, I stick them together, there's gonna be a capacitance. So again, you know, the fact of the matter is, it only depends on geometry. Now there's no charge because there's no potential. There's no energy because there's no potential. And there's no potential, right? So again, everything is reading at zero. So what do we wanna do? And I'll connect the battery and turn on the battery which is about one volt. That just means move the slider bar up to about one volt, See how hard this is for me to do. I got 0 0.416, so I probably won't get one. I got 0.98 earlier today. This thing is very touchy. All right, let me try that one more time. 0.98, look at that, two for two. All right, so 0.98 volts is what, is what we have right now. Now, so, so again, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm on number two here on page four. Connect the battery and turn the battery voltage to about one volt. You may have to zoom in or out. Okay, that's I, I got. Look, I mean, 0.98 is good enough. That's the, that's my that's my that's my voltage from this morning as well. Slowly insert the dielectric inside the capacitor as the dielectric fills more space in the capacitor. Observe and record the changes. All right. So keep your eye on the capacitor meter, the charge meter, and the voltage reading and the energy meter. So I'm, I'm, as I put this, as I slowly put the dielectric in here. So again, the dielectric, is, the dielectric is completely out of the capacitor at this point. I will slowly start putting it in. Okay, not yet. All right, so notice here that as I start putting the dielectric in, you'll start seeing the capacitance go up. You'll start seeing the plate charge go up and the stored energy will go up. So again, everything's increasing. The voltage is not increasing. Everything else increases. And now I have it fully in, right? So capacitance is now, instead of being epsilon naught A over D, it is now kappa epsilon naught A over D. So I've, what I've done is I've now, because, the, because I've put the uh, dielectric in, I have now enhanced the capacitance by kappa. All right, the uh, plate charge, of course, has increased. Why, why did that happen? Well, the plate charge increased, why? Because there's more charge from the polar molecules in the dielectric that are going with the plates. So again, that's enhancing the plate charge and the stored energy. So remember the energy is one half CV squared. That also increased. So again, if, um, remind ourselves here, uh, let's see here. So I wrote all this kind of together. It, it, he has various bullets, capacitance, charge, voltage, and energy. I, I wrote just, I put all together. I put one little statement 
uh, in the space to the right of these four bullets, I, I threw everything together. I said, as the dielectric fills the space between the capacitor plates, the capacitance increases from 0 0.09 10 to negative 12 farads to 0 0.31 10 to negative 12 farads. The charge in the plates increases from 0 0.87 times 10 to negative 13 coulombs to 3.0 times 10 to negative 13 coulombs. Now, again, that looks like positive 13 on the charge on a, on a plate charge. I guarantee you it's not. It's 10 negative, it's 10 negative 13. You, know, you would not want to even be anywhere near a 10 to the 13th Coulomb charge. You wouldn't last very long. So again, 10 to the negative 13. So that's just a mystery there. So again, the charge on the, on, on the plate increased from 0 0.87 to 10 negative 13 Coulombs to 3.0 to 10 negative 13 Coulombs. And the energy stored in the capacitor increases from 0 0.43 to 10 negative 13 joules to 1.49 to 10 negative 13 joules, while the voltage across the capacitor remains constant at 0 0.98 volts. So again, I just basically specified how the capacitance increased, how the plate charge increased, and how the stored energy increased, okay? Remember, stored energy is one half CB squared. The energy stored in the capacitor is one half CB squared. C is the capacitance, the V is the voltage. I mean, I'll write in the board in a moment. Now, remove the dielectric entirely and disconnect the battery. Repeat the steps again. So again, I'm on the bottom of page four. So now we're going to take, we're going to disc, we're going to take the, uh, we're going to disconnect, we're going to remove the dielectric out, and we're going to disconnect the battery. Means take it back to zero volts. See how successful I am at doing that. Uh, what? Well, oh, almost. Let's see. One more nudge. Zero. All right. So now that's effectively disconnecting the battery. And I didn't quite do a good job here. So anyway, uh, let's try to get it to zero. Succeeded this morning. There we go, zero volts. All right, now you notice that the plate charge has gone to zero. Again, Q equals CV. You have to have you have to have a potential to have charge. Stored energy one half CV squared. Again, I'll, I'll write this in a moment. But that also went to zero, and of course that's when the potential went to zero. But notice there's still there's still a value in the capacitance. There's still a value there. Why? Because the capacitance entirely depends on geometry. All right. And so again, I wrote a little statement here that encompassed all the bullets as well. So the the idea here is that. You know, again, I said with the battery disconnected, there is no potential across the capacitor, hence no stored charge. Why? Because Q equals CV. There's no potential, no charge. Uh, with or without the dielectric, right? And however, since capacitance only depends on the dielectric constant in geometry, without the dielectric, the capacitor reads 0 0.09, 10 to negative 12 farads, and with the dielectric completely inside, 0 0.31 times 10 negative 12 farads. Again, without anything connected, you put the dialer again, or you're still going to get the maximum capacitance, which is when the battery was connected or disconnected. The ratio of the capacitance with and without the dielectric is, is the dielectric constant kappa, as it should be. So again, it doesn't matter whether the whether the battery is plugged in or not for the capacitance. It is it only depends on geometry. All right. So what are the conclusions here? All right, so let me stop showing. So all together, um, what do we see? Well, again, so remind ourselves, when the battery's connected, And again, you know, the conclusions are describe your explain your observations using the law of conservation of charge and properties of the conductors, right? Well, okay, so we already talked about that, you know, with battery connected, right? Um, current. will flow in the circuit. 
Now, conservation of charge, since the um, capacitor stores charge, plus Q on, on the positive plate, we'll say on one plate. And negative Q on the other. By the conservation of charge, This, these charges, the, the charge on the plates must be equal and opposite. Since the parallel plates and the wires are conductors, excess charges uh, um, move to the surface of the to the surface of the conductors or the surface of the plates to be in, to be in electrostatic equilibrium. And this is what a conductor does. And that's how we did our derivation, right? You know, the fact that we have a parallel electric field relies on all of this, right? And so, so essentially the very derivation that we did, I mean, so again, you know, the conductors, uh, the, the electric field, Leaving the positive plate and entering the negative plate uh, such um, in a uniform magnitude. and normal to the plate surface, is due to the plates being conductors. Again, another property. You can only have perpendicular or normal electric fields. So again, the very fact that we, so the very application of Gauss's law to derive the formula for the capacitance A parallel of, uh, of the parallel plate capacitor relied on the plates being conductors. Okay, so things like that. I'm a little bit verbose, but I mean, again, you get the idea that. 
this entire this entire um, exercise really relied on this being a conductor. Now, conservation of charge. Well, again, what this charge being stored? If you recall my lectures, you know, the, you, you don't just have. So, in general, you might say, "Oh, well, what's the potential? Well, what's the charge? What's the what's the work done for a potential?" Right? You might naturally want to say it's just Q times V, right? Yeah. Uh, or so, but the, the reality is, it's um, it's not because you have because you know, the first charge that arrives at the plate, there's no charge there already. So that first charge is not, going, is not going to experience any potential. And then the charges are going to arrive and arrive and arrive. And fi the final charge is the only one that's actually going to feel the, the full potential between the plates. And so, again, you can make that argument. You can use integral calculus. But you find out that the energy stored uh, in the um, in electric field between in a capacitor ends up being one half CV squared. All right, and so again, when you have no potential, you have no energy. So as as the as the capacitance increases as you move that dielectric further and further in, the capacitance is increasing. Hence, the energy stored in electric fields increasing. And of course, the charge in the plates. That's just C times V by definition. Again, for a given potential, as you're moving that dielectric again, the capacitance is getting bigger and bigger. And of course, so is the charge on the plates is getting bigger and bigger. So all this stuff, you know, you're seeing, you know, there's no, every charge is accounted for. You know, you look here, I mean, all, all the charges, you know, the charges that are, that you now see that are closer to the plates from the polar molecules. Again, all that's being accounted for. And of course the, um, the charge, Build up in the electric field, uh, or the you know the energy build up in the electric field is also being accounted for. It's um, charge by charge. All right. So your queries. And again, your you have a couple of queries here, and then we're pretty much done. The battery is, is connected. Is the energy of the capacitor battery system conserved throughout the process of inserting the dielectric? Explain. I, and I said as the battery is inserted. Into the capacitor plates, more excess charge is being stored on the plates, increasing stored potential energy. Again, your potential energy is increasing. All the charges are accounted for. U cap is again one half CV squared. And then finally, and number two is really easy. Number two says if the battery is disconnected, does the energy stored in the capacitor remain constant as dielectric is inserted? Explain your change change in energy, if any. Well, there's no changes. Why? Well, because there's no there's no potential. For query number two, there's no potential. So again, you're not going to have any energy, and you saw that. So, so again, you know the um, that's I mean that's that's the lab. Um, you know more you know those nice little theoretical theoretical just uh, 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 explanation to get us you know kind of remind us what chapter 19 was about again, and then you know the, the lab itself. But I mean that's that's pretty much about it. So a lot of it's theoretical. There's not a lot of uh, software involved so and again what you're going to want to do is you're going to you're going to want to turn in the two plots the two linear plots so print them out and turn those turn those in with your lab uh any questions about that for the three of you who are here i can't think of anything thanks for showing up guys i, I do appreciate it yeah of course i mean i think you know this is just on my schedule and so i'm always here right well, what I should just do is say extra credit, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> Can I uh, ask a question? Sure. About the test, actually. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, for the first problem, I'm not sure what I got wrong in part B. And, um... I made a comment, didn't I? Uh, I don't think he did on on B. Let me let me let me double check really quick. Okay. Yeah. If we're gonna move to that, it? number one, we're gonna stop the recording for lab. Okay. Yeah. Let's we'll stop recording. Very good. Good idea. Oh yeah. Well, actually, if I stop, for me to stop recording, I have to, I have to end the session. Okay. It's okay then. No worries. You didn't. You didn't leave a comment on it. It just said zero out of out of five, and I wasn't sure why. Let me take a look at it, and I'll I'll, I'll send you an email. 
Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Huh? You bet. All right. Anybody yeah. have any non non test questions? <laughs> I can't think of anything. All right. I think my wife's got dinners ready for me, so I better. <laughs> well, then you should go eat. Better, yeah, you know, get in trouble. <laughs> All right. You guys have a good. Hey, one. thank you for doing this, by the way. No problem. No, I, I enjoy it. And thank you for showing up. Absolutely. Thank you. Is Allison still there? As best I can tell, she is. Okay. All right. Well, I'll see you guys. I'll see you guys later. I'll send you an email, uh, DJ. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a good night.